Uh, just a little bit about myself. I, I do uh, do some Kotlin programming, but I did not start with Android. I started off with Kotlin on on, on Adobe watching uh, applications. Um, so uh, the, these past two days have been a kind of a unique experience um, in trying to understand the, uh, the Android ecosystem. Um, I, I run a company called Chain Now, so I'm based in New York City. Um, I came back uh, actually up here um, from New York City yesterday, and we'll be going back down um, tonight. Um, so uh, Chainhouse is a um, company that focuses on uh, blockchain, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. Uh, we have a bunch of enterprise clients, uh, and we do events, uh, and uh, we do education, and we have an app studio where we're rolling out a couple different um, solutions. I also teach at uh, Columbia Business School, uh, NYU, and CUNY. I teach graduate level uh, blockchain and AI uh, and machine learning, both on the business side of it um, and the technical side. I've been involved with Java for more than 20 years. Um, I used to work with Sun Microsystems and started um, uh, working with Java early 2000, um, building multi threaded socket based uh, cluster systems. Um, and now I just dabble with a bunch of different languages, um, including Kotlin. I'm writing the, uh, the O'Reilly book on uh, Corda, which is the, uh, the blockchain that is built on uh, Kotlin. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and I run this blockchain meetup group, it's one of the largest blockchain meetup groups. City, if you're around, uh, we've got 45,000 people. Um, it's blockchain NYC, um, uh, one word. Now, we do try to go through this quickly. I usually to spend like seven, eight hours talking about what blockchain is um, in, in classes. Um, so, what, what is blockchain? A lot of people have heard of it. Not everybody's very familiar with it. Um, first of all, it's not Bitcoin, so the two are not related, even though there is some overlap. Um, the two are not, um, they're both going off a different paths now, blockchain has kind of grown into its own thing, and has its own trajectory, and its own roadmap. Um, Bitcoin has its own thing. Uh, so the two should not be conflated with each other. Um, when you break blockchain down and whittle it down to what it really is, um, use the two key points. Number one, blockchain prevents double spend. Right? So double spend is the idea that if I have a digital asset, let's say I have a PDF of a book, and I send you that PDF, um, if you value that PDF greater than a value of zero, then I am potentially infinite, infinitely rich because I can keep repurposing that PDF, right? So if that digital asset has a value of greater than zero, whoever has that digital asset is theoretically infinitely rich. So therefore, digital assets have a value of zero. If I have a PDF of the War and Peace and I send it to you, I can send the same, very same copy to multiple people, right? Or I can um, create a little script and create multiple copies millions of those, uh, those PDFs if I wanted to. Um, and blockchain solves that problem, right? And this is profound, right? This, there are significant implications um, in terms of us as a society and a civilization uh, because double spend has been solved from a digital point of view, right? So um, uh, just like how the information, the information age of the internet uh, changed how we do communication, how we do e-commerce, blockchain is gonna change how we do uh, e-commerce again and how we, how we trade and represent the assets that we trade. We can now trade digital assets. The other aspect of uh, blockchain is it, it attempts to eliminate the middleman or it attempts to decentralize the system. So it identifies a single point of authority or a single point of failure and tries to eliminate that uh, to some degree right, or to a very large degree. Uh, and that's what really what blockchain uh, comes down to. There's a bunch of different blockchains out there that do these kinds of things. Um, but this is the core of what blockchain is, right? So the double spend prevention, I can sell you a digital asset and know, and you can know that I can't sell that to anybody else anymore, right? And that allows that digital asset, um, like a Bitcoin or something else beyond that, to start showing up and collecting value. Um, and so blockchain also, I mean, in, in, in many ways, it's an economic system because I am preventing double spend I can start trading different types of assets um, on the blockchain. So for example, a credit default swap, if you have a, a banking background, um, you're familiar with this, it's a financial instrument, it's fairly complex. I can start trading on the blockchain. If I have a credit default swap and I sell it to somebody, I no longer possess that asset, right? And so today you can't do that if I send you a PDF of an ISDA contract or a credit default swap contract, it means nothing. But if I trade with you on the blockchain, I no longer have that asset. Um, and there's proof that I did that trade with you, uh, and you're able to see that trade, and then I can no longer resell that um, digital asset. 
So with, with, with blockchain, especially in the enterprise space, with blockchain is moving to the enterprise space, uh, what we do share between multiple parties, you know, different participants in the trading system or, or traders, is we have a cryptographically insured data model. Uh, but we don't share data. And I'll show you examples how that looks like. Um, and then the rest, and that's the business side, right? So the economics and economic system is the business side of, of blockchain. The technology side of blockchain is that it's just an evolution of distributed systems, right? So if you're familiar with distributed systems, it's kind of the same, same, same terminology, scalability, threading, Merkle trees, Byzantine fault tolerance, all that still exists. Um, and, and the blockchain space continues to uh, evolve. Now, when it comes to blockchain and Kotlin, uh, there's no blockchain out there that uses Kotlin except one called Corda. Uh, so Corda, from a company called R3, uh, has written a uh, blockchain in uh, 2014 that's completely natively Kotlin. So it's from ground up. It's not a port of Java. It's from ground up. Uh, built in Kotlin. If you go on to their GitHub, um, it's open source. You can see the Kotlin code there. Um, and this, this uh, blockchain, or a distributed ledger, um, has gotten uh, significant market traction. So a um, ton, ton of financial companies, a ton of insurance companies, trade finance companies have come in and started to adopt um, the quarter of blockchain, um, and they're in the news pretty much every day. And then we, what that means is a lot of Kotlin developers are repositioning their careers uh, and finding ways to get involved in these kind of projects. Uh, and we're, uh, as a company, this is something that we're doing as well. Now, how does Corda work? Corda has something that's called a subjective ledger. If you and I exchange data on a blockchain, or see with trading information, or I'm selling you a digital asset, whether it's an invoice, or a, or a financial instrument, or a loan. Uh, there are multiple parties. Each of these parties are called, are called nodes. Nodes. So for example, here on the screen, um, you have Alice and Bob and Carl. Um, each of those can be uh, independent companies, uh, and they form a network um, of, of uh, nodes. Um, and they have their own ledger, right? So that ledger is sub subjective. If I trade, if Alice trades with Bob, Carl can't see that trade. However, if Bob attempts to sell something to Carl, Carl can know that this is something that Bob did, does indeed uh, own and has the right to sell, right? As opposed to Bob trying to sell something that he may not possess. So the Accorda blockchain ensures that if you're buying something or you're trading something on that blockchain, the person that's selling it to you does in fact possess that from a digital asset point of view. So that, that's all done with cryptography. There's a bunch of uh, math behind it. There's hashing and keys and all that stuff and zero, zero knowledge proof. Uh, cryptography involved. Um, and that's kind of broad kind of picture of how a uh, quarter network looks like. Now, if you're building, um, if you're building application, on Corda, Corda uses a, uh, a finite state model uh, uh, approach. You have states, which is basically data on the ledger, right? So a state may be, for example, a financial instrument, a credit default swap, or an IOU loan, right? And I, de I define it basically as a uh, data class. I have to implement certain certain interfaces, and once I do that, that POJO is basically eligible to be stored on the ledger and then potentially traded. Um, so here's an example of a loan state. Um, this is an IOU state, has uh, an amount, a uh, lender, a borrower, and the amount that's been paid up. Uh, and I can track that, and I issue this on the, on the ledger. If I want to borrow, uh, borrow somebody from somebody, I might say, hey, I'm, let's say I'm Bob. I put it on the ledger, and I push it off to Alice. If she digitally signs that, then she's issued me some capital. She's agreed to a loan. Uh, and then offline, off she can send me, send me, send me the money but then that potentially becomes uh, legally binding. So, um, so to create um, uh, things on, on, a, on a blockchain, it's very simple. You just create design a data class, um, and you're able to do that. Um, the other component in a quarter application um, is something called flows, which is basically, if, you're, if you remember, there's something called BPAL or session beams when it was BJBs were around. Um, um, the basic unit of execution it's called a flow. It allows inter-node communication. So one node can kick off a business process and then communicate with another node, with the other node, to continue that business process. Um, and that's all done through flows. And here's an example of a flow where I'm going to issue the IOU, the 
the, this IOU flow goes through a bunch of different steps. It sets up an IOU state object, it wraps it in, in a transaction, and then it proposes that IOU to some other counterpart. You say, hey, I want to borrow money from you. Here are the terms. Um, can you please sign off on this? And within uh, 10 lines of code, you can arrange this, and this can occur between multiple nodes. Uh, the other counterparty node has, so here is, a, this, this flow here is an issuing flow. So the IO issue flow um, originates the loan, and then the counterparty would have a responder flow. Right, so uh, on the receiving side, the counterparty would get a request for a loan, uh, and their flow here would kick off, uh, and it would then potentially either reject that, or digitally sign it, and if they digitally sign it, then they've accepted that loan. And then that loan sits on both of their ledgers, right? And nobody else's ledger, right? sitting on their ledger. Um, and then depending on the, the, what the attorneys have set up, um, that can be um, legally binding. Um, so, and Corda uses a lot of familiar technologies if you're coming from the Java, Java world, or, uh, the enterprise Java world. Um, the internode communication is done through queues um, using uh, Apache um, Artemis, which is uh, the most recent version of ActiveMQ. Um, it uses a protocol called AMQP, which is just been designed by Jake Morgan um, for the wire level communication um, and message format that goes across the queue. Um, there's a, a threading that's done underneath. Um, it's not using just pure Java threads, um, but there is a library called Quasars from an organization called Parallel Universe that uses fibers, which is extremely lightweight. Uh, and we saw this in a talk yesterday, extremely lightweight threads. You can have millions of these um, uh, threads on a machine uh, with very little impact of performance. Uh, and then it's called multiplex, so the fibers are multiplexed over, uh, over a pool of threads, which are then multiplexed over um, cores and CPUs. Um, so, and then it's possible to invoke uh, a core node, to communicate with a core node, outside the core node using RPC, um, and RPC is done through bytecode RPC, um, and then that's wrapped by, if you want, wrapped by a REST API layer. Right, so then of course you can slap on a web application that invokes um, a request for a loan, and then a counterparty on the other side gets a request for a loan on their screen, they can approve the loan, uh, and the two parties are able to then uh, transact. They, they share a consistent cryptographically protected data model, but they don't necessarily share the data. So all the other parties on, on the network do not get a copy of that data. Only the transacting parties uh, will have a, a copy of that data. So that's what I mean by uh, subjective ledger. Um, that's all I have. Thank you, guys. I have the link to the deck if you got anybody wants the deck. It's just bit me slash uh, uh, copy of the blockchain. Awesome. Thank you, Samia. Is it in production? Is, is anybody got um, business on the... Yeah, it's active. They're, 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 so I, there are a couple companies that are doing, they've issued L, uh, letter of credits. And, um, and Corda is yeah. their... Using Corda, yeah. So cool. it's very active in the financial space, insurance, trade finance. Right. Yeah, so yeah thank you very much.